Please hold while I confirm your passcode. Thank you for joining Global Meet. When you hear the tone, you will be the 12th person to join the meeting. My name is Mark Rilenge and I'm on. based in Frankfurt office. I'm responsible for the marketing in the EMEA region. And uh, so for us to quickly get started, I want to give you a couple of technology tips to keep things running smoothly. First of all, you will be on mute throughout the entire session. But if you could also mute yourself, please do so. And second, should you have any technology issues during this webinar, please note that my email is listed on the right-hand side of your screen in the chat box. So please contact me if you have any uh, inquiries. And third, you will hear from me again during this question and answer period at the end of this session. And so let me now give you another tip. Crown's Perspectives Live webinar has CRP credits available for ERC professional certifications. And uh, if you would like to gain credits, please write down the session number that you see on the screen now. It's 16132. And we will show this number again at the end of this webinar. So now I'm pleased to introduce you to Crown World Mobility's Global Plastics Leader for Consulting Services, Lisa Johnson. Lisa is responsible for our perspectives articles and Crown's industry research. She supports our clients with their mobility policies and program strategies she is a leader in addressing innovations and shifts impacting our industry. Lisa is one of the early thought leaders in assignment-related return on investment, diversity mobility, and in the talent mobility area. Lisa has been recognized with ERC's Distinguished Services and Meritorious Service Awards. She has been on the faculty of the GMST certification program. She's a frequent speaker and regularly published across our industry. And so let me now hand over to Lisa Johnson. Well, thank you, Marco, and welcome, everyone. So glad that you could join us today. Um, virtual events are always fun, um, but in the current environment where we are uh, limited to virtual events, I, I, I think it's a very practical and healthy way to stay connected. Um, and I want to give a special shout out to our participants from Dubai today because this was originally scheduled as a face-to-face -face networking event and, and industry meeting. And so we are delighted that you are also joining us here virtually. Um, so for today, I've divided up our session into uh, three parts. Um, you know, first, I'm gonna give you a, some context from a big picture view. And we certainly can't do that without talking about COVID-19. Um, we always, when we look at trends in our industry, look at the issues happening outside of our industry and maybe even outside of the business world that are influencing the trends that we're highlighting in the global mobility world. But I have to say, uh, now, you know, of course, more than ever, there's, a there's something really big that is, uh, that is influencing all of us. Um, so for the majority of time, I am going to walk us through the seven big trends to watch that Crown had originally planned to talk about this year and is still planning to, to is still talking about. Um, because sometimes in the midst of sort of head spinning crisis management, it's refreshing to consider the big picture ideas. Um, and I hope that's true for you today. But that said, I will be weaving in, I think it's interesting to me that almost every trend that we're talking about has some you know, real reality around uh, what we're all living through now in this, in this pandemic too. So I'm gonna point out some of those as well. And then we'll wrap up and hopefully have time for a question or two using the chat function. So we have about 45 minutes and I want to get started. And just as a reminder, if you will uh, just make sure that you're, you mute your phone. I think most people are muted, but we just wanna keep the distractions down. Um, and we will tape this so that you can share it with people too. All right, so today we're not giving World Health Organization updates for safety strategies. I think we're all getting those updates elsewhere. But I do wanna address some of the realities in business, HR, and mobility. Um, just this morning, I'm sitting in Brooklyn, New York, by the way, 
and delighted to be here with you all. And just this morning, you know, just as I was about to join, um, I had an email come into my email box from a company that sells event and movie tickets. And they, the, the header was treats for your future self. And the quote in it was, we all need something to look forward to. Uh, and they were selling uh, Harry Styles tickets and Billy Joel tickets, uh, optimistically projected for April. But I did find it interesting that, you know, whether we're looking at LinkedIn or we're looking at, uh, you know, marketing and uh, that, you know, this is, this is a topic that everyone is, is thinking about. Um, I think the, the important thing to remember is that there will be a rebound. So if we look at China today, and China is now able to even support others around the world while they are still, you know, seeing through this crisis, uh, most organizations are putting into practice strategic staffing and agile workforce strategies for sure, right? We suddenly become experts at that, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, where a few weeks ago, we were giving updates. Our immigration team has fantastic updates. So if you're not signed up for those, please get signed up for them. But, you know, we were talking about the travel bans that companies were putting in place. Well, today, it's the governments that are putting them in place. We don't, we no longer are looking at, well, what's your company doing around travel? We're all, you know, looking to where, you know, we're all looking to stay home and uh, and the governments are issuing those bans. So at the end of the day, there's a lot we don't know yet, but we do know that we will eventually go back to our core business and maybe some new areas of focus too, right? And we're gonna see some things emerge in all of our businesses uh, that maybe we hadn't thought about before. Um, and when that happens, we need to be prepared to move fast and we'll need efficiencies and we'll need to tap into those low cost alternatives in mobility that actually we've been talking about as an industry for at least five, if not 10 years. I mean, we're always looking at low cost, but I think we've become so much better at alternatives to the traditional international assignments. And those of you in the oil and gas industry and in the engineering industry, you've seen these cycles in the past as well. Uh, and we do have low cost alternatives. And so those of you who haven't adopted those yet, maybe you're gonna see yourselves putting them into practice more, or those of you who really went, you know, came up with the, uh, the, the, uh, the strategies that included low cost alternatives, but had a hard time convincing your business leaders to use them, now it's gonna be a no brainer, right? So we'll be ready. Um, honestly, what a difference a month, a week, a day, even an hour can make, right? And it is a bit head spinning, how quickly we're adjusting and adapting to new information. We have an infodemic, I had never used that word before, where new, real, fake information, we just have constant information. We have new vocabulary, right? New behaviors. Our children are now our coworkers. Uh, we're socializing from a distance. I mean, uh, how many of you maybe had a virtual happy hour this weekend using FaceTime or house party or Zoom? We have a a lot of Gen Zs now on this call, not Gen Z, but Gen Zoomers who are mer merging now with Zoom. Uh, and I heard someone last week on a call on this topic say, I miss Brexit. Who would have thought <laughs> you would hear that, right? So the good news is that we are nothing if not agile in the world of global mobility. And so let's take a quick look as we dive into our trends at the broader context for this year's trends are, obviously they were developed before the COVID-19 outbreak, and it clearly changes our look at this year. And as I said, I will do some comments throughout our time together, but to me, it was really clear and reflecting and thinking, do I need to make a big changes to our list now? Um, that, that many of these trends are so applicable to the moment and they'll be critical as we come out of the crisis. So I ask you today to consider the discussion from a few different views, from the present and from the future. So let's give it a try uh, and, and, and take a look at this, this background, this context. So here we are, we're in the first months of the year, still only in the first months of the year. Um, and the lines, even before COVID-19, uh, crisis, the lines between business and politics have been more blurred than ever before. So responsibilities that historically have been seen as political are now being taken on and even champion, championed 
by the global business community. Certainly, there's a rising concern about the effects of climate change that are reframing business priorities in most industries, and that was well underway at the start of this year. Also, the generational shift that we've been talking about for almost a decade, right? Those gen, you millennials, some, you know, it's a, it's a long generation, and, and so there are some, you know, mature or at the early stage of millennials, but now we're looking at the youngest millennials and the emerging Gen Zs um, <clears throat> and the values and expectations in the workplace that are being influenced by this newest generation of what work looks like is becoming a normal part of corporate values and assumptions. And to date, we're kind of on a fast track for it, actually, um, with our agile workforce requirements that are happening right now. So the final backdrop that I want to you know, point out is this notion that corporate stakeholders have expanded to include customers, employees, and communities, as well as that traditional shareholder. And I think that's really, uh, really, we're seeing that validated right now in terms of, of where the business community is rising up, whether it's Louis Vuitton and uh, responding to the French government's call for hand sanitizers and quickly green lighting that, or Ford Motor, you know, uh, Ford, the car company making uh, respirators, um, restaurants that are, are rising up in different communities and feeding medical staff. Um, this current global crisis only confirms that we are in a globally connected, interconnected world, that no wall, no border is useful when we're looking for supplies, innovations, solutions, and I think global business leaders are really, really clear on that. So with that context, let's move into our seven trends to watch, uh, and let's think about them in a variety of ways. Maybe just a refreshing to, to think about something a little different than you've been thinking about every, the past few weeks. All right, I am very excited to talk to you about this first trend on the list, and it's sustainable priorities. And here we are, we're coming out of the hottest decade on record. We see more mainstream acceptance for an urgent action on climate change. Companies and employees are stepping up and finding ways to reduce and improve their environmental impacts. And global mobility, like many industries, on a normal day requires travel, packing, shipping, and more. And there's no way not to have an impact on the environment. But it's definitely time that we start talking about ways to reduce or counterbalance the negative impact of our industry. So that when we go back to normal, we have some of those maybe in place and we're thinking about it newly. So we're seeing some of our clients whose organizations and CEOs are already committed to corporate sustainability begin to look for ways to add this priority to their mobility strategies. I do think a silver lining, if we can even you know, think about that, a few are emerging from our current crisis. And one is air pollution and carbon monoxide levels have fallen at rapid paces in places where people are staying home and traffic has decreased. I'm sure you've seen this. The photos are amazing, the before and after, or the photos from outers from, um, from space looking down as well. But once our economic activity returns to normal, if we haven't made any changes, pollution levels will too, right? Especially because there's going to be a lot of pent up demand to produce at a much more rapid ramp up level. So that ramping up in productivity in our industry will be on overtime in any industry, um, which will increase emissions ultimately unless there's a systemic change. And this is only a pause otherwise, right? So let's look at some small and large ways we can make global mobility more sustainable in terms of priorities in the future. Uh, and, you know, actually, if you and your team have time to consider what, you know, changes you might make uh, once you're out of this, this is really a great, a great team discussion to have with your, with your internal team and with some of your business partners or your, you know, peers in the industry. When we talk about global mobility sustainability, it's about creating meaningful reductions and making smarter choices at any level. Individual levels, 
team levels, company-wide levels, and at an industry level. It can also be about encouraging our supply chains and business partners to strive for more sustainable goals. So our full perspectives article, which is being launched this week, if you haven't received it, you, you'll be getting it. Uh, it goes into more detail on considerations and actions that you can take to get started. But one of the areas I like most is just that individual level. You know, when you say, well, how do I get started? Uh, let's just look at the individual level for global mobility programs. I like that idea of providing green guidelines for relocating employees prior to their move that highlight sustainable ways to reduce waste during the move. Really, you know, it could be very straightforward, helping your employees make personal choices with positive consequences. Like identifying ways to donate personal goods that aren't going to be packed, that don't make sense to store, including canned food, excess furniture, appliances, cars. Um, there's an organization here in the U.S. that's also in a couple of other countries called Move for Hunger. And it's an example of an organization that takes employees donated canned goods and they have a box with their label on it right in the home of the person who's moving where you can put the food, the canned goods, and non-perishable foods there, and it gets donated right into the local community where that employee is leaving from. It's a great way, it's just, I wanna give the example because whether this organization exists where you are or not, it's just a great example of how to contribute to your local community, especially, you know, uh, at, at any time. From a global mobility team level, as I mentioned before, I really love the idea of giving your team a challenge this year to come up with ideas for how they and your employees and your company can move this topic ahead. Offsetting the environmental impact of your program, and we can see the environmental impact of offsets or you know resets or stopping. So if we can think about offsetting the environmental impact of a global mobility program at a corporate level, whether it's making a donation to a green organization for every authorization you have each year, uh, planting trees, you know, something that your organization is, becomes more aware of the impact of their global mobility program. And again, it's an emerging topic, but we're really excited to start talking about it. At Crown, we've gotten, generated some great conversations and with some of our, our clients that we work with, and we hope to inspire you to move forward with us um, in the coming years. All right, let's move on to our second trend on this year's list, and that's duty of care. And duty of care is definitely a recurring topic, but this year we want to give a focus to mental health during an assignment. And mental health in the workplace is certainly a growing area of focus for many of our organizations. If I go into many of your, uh, your um, corporate uh, websites, you'll find d duty of care and sustainable priorities. Several of our trends are right there as, as general priorities for your organizations. So I wanna do a couple of things as we talk about mental health and duty of care here, uh, because I think it's such an important topic any year, but especially today. Um, so let's just do a little, first let's start with a little refresh about duty of care. Of course, a big part of mobility related duty of care lies in preparing relocating employees and their families, business travelers for the unexpected, right? Uh, illness, accidents, personal and family security, political upheaval, terrorism, immigration changes that could impact an assignment. That's in an, on a normal day. Um, and other duty of care actually involves less common concepts, but I think they're important for us as strategic global mobility uh, professionals to think about too, which is topics like understanding the financial implications of a, of a move for an employee, um, and, or helping your business partners understand the duty of care responsibilities of your organization on not doing harm to employees and their families. And that comes up when you have a business, maybe a business leader who's looking to eliminate key support for a company requested move. And you, you, we have a responsibility to, to explain why certain types of support are there for the duty of care of our employees and our organizations. For the employee, that could be the tax consequences, preparation for cultural differences, new languages, those fall under duty of care support. But really, it's often in an emergency or a time of crisis that reminds us how important it is to have a duty of care plan in place, doesn't it? 
So here we are, and we are in the middle of that crisis, and so we can't speak about duty of care and not talk about emergency preparedness and maybe some of the things that have just you've just gone through in your global mobility program or your organization or that you're still going through right now. Uh, so let's look at it from three topics. And I want to start right there at the top of your screen in just looking at on a good day, what should exist in a policy. I want you to think about or how are we doing with this particular duty of care element. So we know from just a recent long-term assignment policy survey that Crown did uh, just at the end of last year, that less than half, 49% of policies address things like an emergency evacuation. And of those 49% of policies that address that, 56% provide transportation to the nearest safe haven, 30% state that living expenses will be covered. So there is room to shore up policies on basic emergency evacuation discussions, absolutely. So that's sort of our, our, some people call it hygiene or other people call it, you know, these are the, just the base core things that need to be in place. But a strategy, of course, includes relationships with your network, um, like international SOS, to make sure employees have access to information and support. That's so common today. You know, right now we think about that, but we could have talked about it also with Brexit or with SARS in the past or with Icelandic volcano, even in a more distant but recent past, right? We rely on contingency plans to get a sense of how prepared we are with information. So, and, and I have to tell you, International SOS is such a, an example of an organization that definitely, and we'll talk about this in just a second, but giving access to men, mental health professional counsel, counselors for emotional support, and that's really critical um, in a time uh, like this. Um, so I think one of the, another silver lining, you know, outcome from this, if there is one, has been putting agile and flexible work options into action. Because different industries and different parts of the world have resisted allowing for flexible work options. And a reminder that flexible work option does not mean everyone works from home all the time. Uh, it means having agility so that there are flexible ways of working. I know, you know, it could be, you know, having some people work in the office on certain days and some people not, or starting at a different hour. Um, we've had to adjust to these, uh, and we've had to put those in place because people, in many cases, can't go into their offices. But I will say and remind you that flexible work options are very good for families and for gender equality strategies and for recruiting new talent. So on the end of this, at the end of this, having more open mind to agile and flexible work options is going to really enhance your ability and anyone's ability to recruit new talent and to, uh, and to um, put those in action outside of this moment right now. The other thing to remind you here with contingency plans and with the coronavirus is is, uh, you know, social distancing. Um, it should be social distancing, but not social isolation. So seeing a lot of companies and teams putting in place virtual coffees, virtual meetings, virtual check-ins, and we need to just keep that up and share with each other those ideas. On LinkedIn, I'm finding great source on LinkedIn and on Twitter around, you know, uh, Avoiding social isolation, which is true whether it's in your families or on your teams or your workforce. So let's close out this trend, going back to the focus of a mental health for international assignees. Um, you know, when an emergency happens and you're away from home, it can feel even more stressful. And I want you to just think how many of you had assignees or new hires who had arrived in a new location in the last quarter of 2019, or right at the right at the end, and imagine any stress that comes from an international assignment or a move gets exacerbated when you haven't had time to adjust to your new location, set up your social network, set up your communities, and feel connected. Um, so that's a really important thing to keep in mind when you think, okay, we've done our communicating now with people to tell them what is what is happening you know, really have you communicated enough and to keep that drumbeat of communication going. So let's think about employee mental health for international assignees. 
uh, what, what do we know? We know that moving causes stress. Culture shock is just another word for stress. Even when you're highly motivated, your employees and families are being disrupted from their communities and friends and family. So for the employee, often we know that they're top performers when they're at home and suddenly they're in a new environment with a new manager with new ways for many things that feel like that feel very normal in a business environment, maybe giving and getting feedback, communication, meeting participation, which varies across cultures, humor, which I use a lot of, but you know, you can get, doesn't always translate across cultures, interaction, hierarchies, manager and subordinate relationships, right? Very visible and potentially stressful situation when you arrive on an international assignment. And if that employee is accompanied, then uh, they are worried about their family's adaptation. And if they're alone, they're alone. And they have to manage both work and daily living settling in. So that's on a normal day outside of our current crisis, that those kinds of stresses can happen. And, and uh, only a few companies are doing uh, very much at all in this space in terms of having information prepared and talking to their assignees about mental health support. I also think it's important to remember that the accompanying partners, that second blue box there over to the right, have often have a more challenging role in a move. It can, they can be more isolated. Many times today, they've left a job back home. And so when the employee goes off to work and if they have a family, the kids go off to school, it's the partner who's left to initiate all of their interactions and activities alone. They don't have an instant community. It has to be formed. So as a result, it's critical right there on the right of your screen. I want you to think about this. What are some ways that we can educate HR, our sending and receiving managers, and your global mobility team? How do we get up to speed so that we're able to educate employees about the resources available to support mental health on assignments? I think that we can you know, get more comfortable with this. I like the idea of a, having, you know, getting our teams confident and equipped under normal circumstances so that it will also help in a crisis um, because uh, it's so key to have this as a standard part of your program um, in addition to uh, not just putting it in place when there is, is a crisis. But I do want to give a shout out to those of you who have this in your programs or are partnering with companies like International SOS, where you're able to give access to mental health professional counseling or emotional support anytime, but especially right now where people are more isolated. And I do think we need to change the language that we're using when we talk to our colleagues at work so that we think about, you know, socializing and working from a distance but not social isolation and checking in on each other and making sure that we're all doing okay. All right, our third trend is focused on global mobility communities, which I think also in an, on a normal day is a really interesting concept, which I wanna share with you well, my thinking around why this was important to have on our trends list this year, but it actually is very useful right now in our moment where we are all having to be, you know, working from home or working in a very different in situation than we were a month ago, two months ago, right? So, global mobility communities. Today, more than 40% of the world is on social media. Now, you might say, that might make you look up and go, huh? I think 100% of the people in my world are on social media. But in the world, 40% of the world are on social media connected and sharing information. That number is likely to go up very quickly over the next month or so, and I'll actually share with you some data that we already have coming out of China on that in a few minutes. But linked to this reality is a growing trend around participating in online communities made up with people with common interests, sharing information, exchanging ideas, and they can be public or private. I think we're all benefiting from those right this minute right now, right, of, of checking in and see, you know, even just sharing funny videos. And there are so many going around out there right now um, that can give you a smile and feel connected. This year, the reason why we wanted to talk about global mobility communities, we had two things that we were thinking about. And I still think they're very relevant for the current situation and the future, the rebound. I think they'll be even more relevant. 
So first we see communities as a platform that will benefit diverse employee populations on international assignments or relocating for their jobs in sharing similar situations, in getting to know a new neighborhood, a community. It is especially valuable for those less represented mobile populations, like female employees, male accompanying partners, members of the LGBTQ community, that, that those less represented communities, helping them to find people to connect to, to talk about their, uh, you know, adjustment or situations which might be less common. Where we see new growth opportunities is for communities within global mobility teams. Boy, we are all just really polishing some of these skills, and we're going to see where some of our gaps are and those teams that are high-performing teams from a virtual level. Um, and some of you already have it. Some of you, every, we all have to adjust in one way or another. None of our teams, even if we're virtual employees normally, not uh, the situation has changed. But with internal or external team members, this is a place to quickly share information, questions, best practices, challenges, without waiting for the next meeting. So companies that use Yammer, that use Workplace from Facebook, that use Microsoft Teams, they're leveraging them for these purposes, and we expect this to be the norm for globally dispersed teams uh, as technology continues to improve. Uh, and um, right now, with COVID-19 and working from home, it's certainly an asset for business continuity, for connections and ways to support each other. I think this changing, it's changing the dynamic for geographically dispersed teams. So not only is technology and these communities that many of our organizations are using changing the dynamic for the teams, but now we're putting it into practice at such a quick pace, it's going to be very interesting you know, in a few months for us to look and say, what something we do so much better today because we had to put it into practice very quickly around global mobility communities and strengthen them. Um, I know many of you from different parts of the world who have reached out to me over the past couple of years saying, let's start blogs, let's start communities, let's get something for, you know, one region or a certain industry. And now I think, you know, we're just going to see that sort of blossom in new ways and people, you know, kind of move, move forward with that. Okay. Let's go to a topic that right now is or isn't on your minds, but I think um, it's, it's an interesting thing for us to think about right this minute. And that's all about, this fourth trend is all about repatriation. So in the past, repatriation, of course, was that conversation you might have when discussing the phase that comes at the end of assignments. That, of course, still exists. But we've seen over the past few years an increase in alternatives to repatriation. Uh, and we've talked about these before, like those employees of yours that are on consecutive assignments. So they just go from one place to another. It's global career path. Maybe localization into the assignment location. And certainly those of you who are in the oil and gas and engineering industries have lived this option even in the past five years, right, or six years where international assignees are offered local jobs but they can't because companies can't you know keep them on the very high cost international assignments and in some cases families have repatriated uh, because they're not going to stay in the host location as a local employee um, but it's really sort of a, di a dilemma that has been, you know, that, that is trying to get resolved. So that's an example. Localizing into the assignment location is something that often happens at the end of a, a, tr a tr normal international assignment because uh, maybe there's not another job in the new location or back home, right? So another alternative to repatriation is finding a new role in a location that's not your home country or the location where the assignment is. But really one of the biggest challenges today of companies with very mature mobility programs and burgeoning mobility programs, one of the biggest challenges is still post-assignment placement and repatriation. And so we, as a result, have to evolve the definition of repatriation. So lately, we're looking at something new that we're calling happy attrition. And I know it sounds a little strange, especially in a moment where you know, we're all thinking about jobs, but there are some companies that may not mind and even expect some employees to move on at the end of an assignment. 
turnover is not always a bad thing. And clearly, it's not the case for all attrition, but some agile companies are focused on innovation. They don't just manage change, they embrace it, and they're better prepared for some of the attrition that occurs. So I, I just want to us to think about repatriation since I, you know, we could count on one hand the companies that do it very well. We need to broaden our definition of it, and so we're just adding one more category to that broad definition of repatriation. All right. So, of course, we're in 2020, and we can't have a trends list without focusing on the big X, right? And it's our second year in a row with this topic as a trend, and we're watching how it evolves in our industry. So, EX, the employee experience, is certainly driving improvements across the board for customers, employees, and for everyone, right? It just is in any industry, anything that you're doing. But in global mobility, we see AX, the assignee experience, GMX, the global mobility experience, and new demands and customer behavior create dissatisfaction if your mobility program is doing a lot of things. So right there on your screen, I have a few different you know, things that if you went through it, you say, these are things that cause dissatisfaction. There are so many things that cause dissatisfaction, right? But in a global mobility program, if you went through that list right there, which ones could you check off and say, that's not a problem for our company, that's not a challenge for us? Ignoring onboarding is one of the ones I put right at the top because I know you know that last year that was such a buzz in global mobility, looking at the onboarding process. If you have not changed your onboarding process for when somebody is coming into the global mobility program, in the past two years, you probably are not focused on in EX, in global mobility EX, uh, in terms of how we bring a family and a signee in, or using poor communication or outdated methods to present a process. I have Excel spreadsheets up there. However, I know that some of you from the most technologically advanced companies still use Excel spreadsheets. Uh, so I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. It happens across many organizations. Um, but also, how about those of you who maybe still have 35-page policies that read more like a list of, do you know, thou shalt not, as opposed to something that's employee-friendly, maybe that's click-through, that you have icons in it, and it really speaks to your employees or your users. Look at your benefits policies for HR and see how they have, in many cases, gotten really updated, but not necessarily your global mobility policy. So that's an area that we're working with a lot of companies on in terms of updating policies to be user-friendly, click-through, easy, you know, something that feels comfortable using. But one of the best improvements we see for global mobility EX is uh, how it applies to and really enhances flexible programs and flexible choices, these do-it-yourself options or flexible options uh, that are now increasingly available in global mobility programs. It supports that flexible policy trend and the increased use of lump sum and employee choice. So until recently, the biggest concern for flexible and do-it-yourself moves has been related to the challenges that they bring. We did some research on this last year, and the number one, you know, fear or uh, frustration or worry that people had about giving uh, do-it-yourself lump sum or flexible programs to employees was the negative employee experience. And we t actually did some focus groups with some employees that were receiving more lump sum do-it-yourself moves, and, and they really spoke to those productivity dips uh, due to the time demands on top of either wrapping up an old job or starting a new job, people having inconsistent experiences. So the good news here, and I want this to be more of a good news than you know thinking about all those things that, that are negative about it, because the good news is that there are a growing number of tools available to improve the experience. Technology makes these choices much more user-friendly. Crown has something called a flex tool, but there are lots of options out there now in the market, and that is uh, fantastic for the global mobility experience. It makes benefits with options easier than ever to assess and to manage. So here we are at a time when booking a cab or watching a movie, making a payment can be done remotely, 
And so the availability of more standard technology to manage flexible options in policy is a big step. And right now, so we talk about the rebound that's going to happen, and I was mentioning that earlier, because inevitably there will be a rebound. We will go back to our core businesses. And at that time, though I remember I mentioned those lower cost solutions and efficiencies are going to be king. They're going to be right there, a, you know, requirement from our businesses. So having this global mobility experience technology is fantastic. Uh, and um, so that is something to think about. It's definitely the COVID-19 has highlighted the importance of technology to ensure business continuity. Um, and so we're going to want to uh, ensure good experiences for our employees. I, I think just talking about technology, one of the a piece of research that I was looking at uh, last week was just some uh, some information that was coming out of China and consumer behaviors and the changes in consumer behaviors. In two weeks, only in the in a matter of two weeks, e-commerce was adopted in China by a whole new generation of elderly people, uh, citizens in China and people who were living in lower tier cities who had never embraced e-commerce before. Either of those populations, if you were from a lower tier city and location or people who were at an you know, the higher end of the multiple generational life that we live, right? But within two weeks, their behaviors changed and they, uh, they uh, adopted a new way of purchasing because they had no choice. So behaviors will change. We will see some new normals when we come out of this. And I think that's an interesting thing to think about for our populations as well of expectation. Okay. So here we are. Taking a quick look, we're, I think we're doing fine on time. Um, so for our second to last trend, we're going to be talking about diversity and leadership. And you may say, you know, why do we want to talk about this today? And, but I have to tell you, even in a crisis, we have to remember our North Star values. And we have to remember who we are and what's important to us as organizations. And diversity goals are about mindset and behavior, not increasing the budget or spending more. So I think, you know, let's talk about mobility links to diverse, diversity leadership. Because um, we've got some in interesting data to share with you. We recently finished a study of 100 global companies around the diversity inclusion links to mobility. And there were a lot of good findings in that study. And the, uh, the full study can actually be found on our website or send me an email. I'm happy to share it with you. But one of those findings really jumped out to us, and we're expanding on it here. So we asked companies whether international experience is valued or required in their organizations. Does it give your employee a leg up, an advantage in their career path? And so let's look at a couple of uh, data points here. First of all, our research confirms that having a diversity inclusion strategy is now pretty normal. 68% of participating companies have these strategies, and we could cut the data across regions. And that was true. You know, we did a study back in 2013, our first study on diversity and inclusion. And really, when we looked in certain parts of the world, people said, you know, not here. We don't have that yet. But now, actually, we can cut the data across major regions and the 68% of companies with diversity and inclusion strategies holds pretty true. So DNI is certainly on most companies' radars and an increasing priority, right? And another 16% said we don't have it yet, but we're adding it. And you can divide this data by mature companies that have had it for a long time. Some of you are nodding your heads. You're like, yep, yep, our CEO has been talking about this. It's in our DNA. We have great programs around diversity and inclusion or companies that are just getting started with this, with only having it in the past one to three years to have a strategy in place. Um, but there is always room to improve with any, no matter where you are in terms of your DNI journey in your organization. Uh, so when we asked, is international experience valued or required in relation to career advancement? The answer was profoundly yes, both for the general population and for senior leadership. So if you look on the left of your screen and the blue uh, and the dark gray sections of the chart, 79% uh, of companies said it gives an employee an advantage or it's even required in relation to career advancement. And the same was true there on the right, 
for advancement for senior leaders. Maybe in that dark gray, you can see that a few more companies require international experience in order to move ahead. But this is a really big eye opener for global mobility and talent mobility teams. So if your company values or requires international experience, but the mobility population does not reflect the DNI priorities and goals of the company, the future leaders in your organization are not going to reflect the diversity and inclusion priorities either. Just start with gender equality, since we, you know, this month have been celebrating International Women's Day. Is there gender equality in your mobility program? Is there diversity, even multi-generational diversity? How would you get started on this topic at all? So the study that we have actually provides you with uh, more information on where the different priorities are in different in companies around uh, their diversity and inclusion, which priorities uh, are are the most salient, and actually gender across regions companies. Thank you. Uh, is uh, is definitely true, but. Here I just want to highlight a few examples of ways that companies that have links to diversity and inclusion strategies in their organization are uh, giving visibility to it. And only 29% of companies have any links, formal or informal links between mobility and diversity and inclusion strategies. So there is room for improvement. Um, and so here are just a few ways this slide shows ways that companies are promoting and focused on diversity and inclusion. Uh, and, in, in, and raising an awareness around diversity mobility. Even those first two over there on your left of having profiles or photos, similar to recruiting strategies, right, and DNI. Um, even information on the intranet. Uh, I saw, went to one of our clients' um, websites recently, and they had a, a video about a female engineer, and she was, had been recently relocated from one city to another. And they had a short video about her career path, her journey, had some an interview with a couple of her managers talking about the importance of her role in the, on their team and her career path, and talking about how mobility had you know, supported her relocation. And that might be like two minutes, three minutes, and it's a way for someone to say, oh, wow, someone who looks like me uh, is 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 also you know someone whose career is being benefited by mobility um, and by the, supported by the organization. Uh, the last example on the right is probably one of my favorites because it's so simple and so it, you know doesn't cost you anything, and that's adding the diversity inclusion logo of your organization to your mobility team signature. It shows an openness. It shows that you're a supporter or an ally of the strategy. It's simple and a positive step, and Crown just uh, added it just in the past six months. Um, and if you want to see it, you can send me an email. I'll respond. You can see our logo on my response. I think it's just a, a, a great simple way to show that your global mobility team is open-minded to all of the kinds of diversity that your in company is, is focused on. So just as a last thought here on this, no matter what industry you're in, the business case for diversity inclusion has been made already. I mean, I have a stack of studies from Air Inc., from Mercer, Deloitte, KPMG, the World Economic Forum, and many more that provide data showing financial and strategic benefits for companies with more diversity in their DNA. So the big question coming from our research isn't should companies care about diversity inclusion? Uh, it's because that's already, they already do. They already do. So the question is, are global careers accessible in your organization's diverse workforce? And that's where mobility comes in. So maybe now in the coming month or so, it's a good time to just put this, your team to task and say, let's look at this, assess this space, and see what we can do moving forward that will help us be better linked to our diversity inclusion strategy. What can we measure that will help us tell the story of where we're strong and where some gaps are in our organization. All right, now we've come to the last big trend to watch in 2020. And I'm excited to end with this topic because it is about the spread of organized, coordinated domestic mobility for companies in new locations. And most of you know that domestic relocation as part of a corporate global mobility program has evolved historically 
more in the UK, Canada, the US, and Australia. And part of this history is cultural. Part of it is, is uh, cultures that are open to leaving home in search of a new adventure, and that there historically have been there have been movements to do that. Part of it is political in terms of having an openness to migration and the laws and regulations that have allowed it for people to move within their own country easily. That's not to say that other countries have not had domestic corporate relocation, but it's on a, typically on a much smaller scale and the policies and approaches are less formal and not tracked. Um, so much more ad hoc and negotiated without guidelines. So at Crown, we've been tracking companies that are incorporating domestic mobility under the global mobility function. And it has slowly increased in recent years. And I feel like it's getting, you know, generating some real momentum. So I just wanna share with you a few thoughts that I have on this and what we're seeing um, for you to think about within your own programs and thinking about Maybe not even, you know, your current state and your future state as well. Like, what, what will we need in order to be agile coming out of this crisis as well? So, um, some of the drivers have to do with what you see here on your screen. Consistency in the employee experience. I mean, imagine if you have an HR manager who only relocates one or two people a year, it isn't always going to be something they do well. Uh, and, you know, I think about if there, are, if you know anyone on your team, I won't speak from personal experience, who only does their expense reports a couple of times a year, they don't do it well. You have to relearn how to do it. And the same is true for mobility. If you don't have a lot of volume for domestic relocation in every location, but you want, are focused on the employee experience. Um, so other benefits to having an organized domestic relocation program is cost tracking, use of technology to support moves. I don't think we can look back at what we've been through in the past month or two and not have an appreciation for the ability to track who is where and uh, to track, um, you know, employees and information, right? So uh, that definitely is true. But I really want to focus on the employee experience here in the war for talent, which will only get greater, who, where you're looking to attract and hire great people, where maybe you have, you're going to have needs to move people from one city where you had business to, to a place where you're ramping up new business. Whether you're in China, Singapore, Japan, Brazil, Germany, Dubai, wherever you are, uh, that is that is really important. And what you don't want to be doing is winging it, right? You don't want things to be ad hoc. You want that consistent employee experience. Um, I don't think any of us can, can afford to wing it these days, right? Um, the other thing that was interesting just a few weeks ago, again, what a difference, a, you know, a month makes. Um, just about a month ago, I was in Crown's Madrid office and speaking to some of my, my colleagues there, and domestic mobility across Spain is on the rise, just as one example. And one of the key ways that they're supporting our clients there is around partner support for job outplacement. So when you have dual career families and you're asking an employee to move and they're asking their partner to find a new job or leave a career, how, being able to say, my company is gonna help you with outplacement, with getting your resume together, with getting ready for your job search, certainly helps as one of those, you know, reducing the barrier for that critical talent that you are asking to move to, to do that. Because culturally, split families, where the employee goes and the, uh, the family stays behind, is not, a, not something that employees are willing to do everywhere in the world. Um, so that's just one example there on the benefits of global domestic programs. I want you to, to, to think about that. All right. So we've concluded our seven trends to watch, but I'm actually hoping that this is a, a beginning for you to consider which of these topics you're you know, gonna maybe focus on now or get inspired to as we, we're gonna be called to innovate and to address increasing demands from our employees, our customers and our business partners just more and more as we come out of and rebound from our current crisis or even in the midst of it, right? Um, and anytime there's a shift or a crisis or an event that we have to respond to as we are today, we learn that agility and openness to change are critical characteristics in today's world. 
So I can't wait to hear which of our trends you're also thinking about, whether it's sustainability priorities, mental health for assignees. I would you know, love for us to start a conversation on that and really push that forward right now. Uh, repatriation and happy attrition, was that a new idea for you this time? Or diversity mobility? I'm looking forward to some great discussions here in our global mobility communities that we have um, that we're all participating in. So I appreciate you spending time with us today. And with that, Marco, I'm gonna give it back to you to move us into, see if there are any questions or comments of coming out of this session. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Uh, so yeah, okay, everyone, if you would like, um, feel free to type any questions directly into the chat space on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will see what will come in, what we can um, answer today. Yeah. So one question, Marco, I'm not sure if you can, can you see the questions or can, can I go through them a little bit? No, so far, I, haven't, I actually, I have received one by email that I can yeah. read out. So one is, will the presentation be shared? And absolutely, we'll share the presentation with you. And I think, you know, we're also, we're, we're doing another one of these sessions on uh, Thursday. And that will be in the afternoon in Central Europe. Of, so it'll be at 4 p.m. Central uh, European time. And uh, so and once we finish that also, we'll, we'll be sending out recordings to everyone if you're interested or sharing it with your team. But yes, the presentation will be shared. And the full article, the full Perspectives article goes way more into detail than what I've done today. Anything else, are there any more? Yeah, and, uh, and there's one, um, what's the best way to get started with sustainability priorities for a global mobility program? Well, I'm so glad someone asked about sustainability priorities because I'm really excited about this. I think it's an exciting addition to our trends list, but certainly to our industry to start thinking about. And, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that a global mobility sustainability is really about making those smarter choices, you know, and I like breaking it down where, what can we do at an individual employee level? What could we do as a company level? What about our global mobility team? Should we have some competition of who, you know, coming up with ideas around uh, even how we work more in a more green way or in a more sustainable way? Um, and, uh, you know, virtual solutions are a great example. So virtual home finding trips, virtual, uh, virtual language lessons, virtual cross-cultural training programs, the virtual solutions um, when they don't compromise decision-making and family pre preparedness is what I would have said a month ago, then they're really key. Right now, virtual solutions is everything, isn't it? So, you know, I, I think the more that we can look to uh, having videos, short videos and virtual solutions, you know, the better. Um, but even just changing language and policy or communication to encourage green options, like adding your company's commitment to green choices in different places in your policy, like maybe under host, look, host country transportation options, where you say we, our organization encourages public transportation wherever possible, and uh, you know there there are ways that you can address this with low hanging fruit, and then some obviously some big systemic ways to to look at it. So um, I think there are many steps to get started, and we cover them more in our in our uh, perspectives article. All right, one. I'm not sure if there are any more, okay. but while we're doing this, I just want to, first of all, I'll encourage you to take care of yourselves and the people around you. And this was a message from the Society for Human Resources Management that I thought was really, uh, you know, a, a good message to come out for all of us to think about. But then also I want to put up, we'd love to get your feedback on this. So Marco, I'm going to ask you if we have another question. And while we, if we do, while we answer it, then I definitely want you all to, you can hold up your phone and uh, and just put the camera, well, the instructions are right there in front of you. But anyway, we'd love to get your feedback too about what your experience with today's session. Marco, did we have another question? Yes, one more. Uh, have you heard anything related to the implication of blockchain technology into our sector in terms of sustainability? Wow, so that's a great question. And I have to say, I don't think I've, prepared to answer that question right now, but as soon as I get off the 
this call. I'm going to, you know, pull together some uh, some answers for that and to be able to share that because uh, I do believe, you know, in ter- uh, well, I'm not even going to try to answer that because I, I, uh, I, I am focused on how our supply chains you know, really um, need to be, uh, you know, connected and, and how we can encourage the different supply chains that we have around sustainability and sustainable priorities and putting them into KPIs and really encouraging the people we do business with to also share these values. But I don't think that's answering your question. So um, that's a really good question and we'll ca- capture it and then think, you know, we'll put together some of the questions that are coming through now and uh, and maybe send out some follow-ups on that. So thank you, and Marco, if you'll just make sure we know where okay. that's coming from and, and definitely put some um, response behind that. Yes, we'll get back to that. Yeah, so thank you, Lisa. We are now at the end of this Perspectives live session. I hope that you have enjoyed it. Uh, we always look forward to sharing our annual trends with you. And remember that you can receive CRP credits of, for the um, ERC certificate. And the number is 16132. Right there on the bottom of the screen. All of our perspectives, yes. All of our perspectives articles are also posted on our World Mobility website. And all of you on today's webinar will receive one when it's launched. And it's actually launched uh, by the end of last week. It has been launched. So you will receive um, the link to it. And uh, you will also receive um, the feedback form. We actually see it on the screen. And uh, please let us know what you think about this uh, webinar. And um, yeah, and we, will, we would like to hear also um, from you what you think about for future events. So thank you very much for attending this Perspectives Live series. And a big thanks to Lisa Johnson. Thanks so much, Marco. And someone did just ask for that number again. It's 16132 for the ERC CRP credit. And we just want to, you know, from Crown out to all of you, we want to, you know, just thank you for joining us, as Marco just said, but also, you know, uh, we're sending you lots of uh, of good wishes for um, staying safe and uh, and looking out for each other. I think this is so important today and I think we all will agree on that so we're so glad that you could join us I feel connected and I hope you do too just connected to each other today and we look forward to more uh, virtual sessions now um, going forward and we certainly hope you'll join us again thanks everybody